Um, today we're joined by Professor Tony Ng. He received his PhD in mathematics from McMaster University in Ontario, Canada in 2002. And he is currently a professor in the Department of Statistical Science at the Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas in the USA. His research interests include reliability, censoring methodology, ordered data analysis, non-parametric methods, and statistical inference. He is also the associate editor for several prominent journals, including Communications in Statistics, Computational Statistics, and Naval Research Logistics. He's the co-editor of several books, including Ordered Data Analysis, and Statistical Quality Technologies, Theory and Practice, published by Springer. Um, and he's also a fellow of the American Statistical Association, as well as an elected member of the International Statistical Institute. Um, today, he will be presenting with us um, a seminar entitled Semi-Parametric and Non-Parametric Evaluation of First Passage Distribution of Bivariate de uh, Degradation Processes. So I'd like to hand over now to um, Tony. Thank you very much for joining us. Okay, thank you, Ryan, to uh, organize all this and uh, thank you for the uh, organizer of this uh, center. So uh, today I'll present something about first passage time distribution of bivariate degradation processes. First, this work is based on uh, two recent paper that my student and myself and uh, also my colleague uh, work on. Uh, these two paper, one is in uh, reliability engineering and system safety, uh, is this year. And the other article related to the talk that I'm going to give is in Applied Stochastic Models in Business and Industry. So uh, if you're interested in more on this work, so you can look at these two papers. Uh, first of all, I'll introduce to you what is the problem, okay? what problem we are trying to solve, what is called degradation, what is called uh, first passage time distribution, why people are interested in that. And then I'll go into the technical part to explain to you the approaches that we are taking, uh, how we solve the problem for the first passage time distribution for one dimension. And then now if we have binary, we have higher dimension, how we can uh, model the dependency between different uh, different stochastic processes. Okay, so first I want to explain to you what is degradation data and what is first passage time distribution. So I'm showing you some pictures here, some uh, items like LED lighting, you, you may know. Uh, this one is a laser uh, that those are subject to degradation and they all have high reliability like this one uh is a is a battery so on uh, on your cell phone so of course there's a battery there so all these are subject to uh they have high reliability in other words it takes a long time for them to fail like led lighting some of them if you buy that from the store they will tell you that on average it will last 20 years so it is impossible to do a reliability test or live test to get information about the lifetime. You cannot wait for 20, uh, 20 years for that item to fail and then collect the lifetime data. Even you do accelerated live tests, you accelerate the failure. It may not be feasible. So what people do in reliability is they go and measure some characteristic related to the failure time. Like in LED lighting, we measure the light intensity and that light intensity will drop uh, when you use that item. Like battery, they go and measure the charge and recharge uh, capacity and that will keep dropping uh, when you use the battery. So in this case, if we can get the measurement for the degradation characteristic for LED lighting will be uh, the light intensity 
battery, maybe the uh, charge recharge capacity. We can go and use that build a statistical model and then go and predict what is the lifetime of that item. And you may wonder what is this item over here. Uh, these are the knife to cut uh, potato chips. Uh, I'm showing you that because my student, after he graduated, he went to uh, PepsiCo to work and that's the company for uh, Fair Day. So that's pro producing potato chips and they actually need to study how long it will take for the, for the potato cutter to failure. So this is uh, a real example and people use that in practice. Now, what is called first passage time distribution and why we interest in that? I show you a graph over here. This is one dimension. The black curve over here is about the degradation. If you can't understand this, think about a simple example about crack size. The things may crack and then when the crack is keep growing and until a point, that is what we call the first hole, the C over here. When the crack is so large, then the material will break. So that's exactly describing that kind of process. The crack keep increasing until a point that will break. So the breaking point is the TC over here. This is called the first passage time distribution. There are a lot of application is a, is a problem that people uh, have been studied for a long time. Uh, if you, you look at that, that is related to uh, stock market. C may be a first hole that they will sell, sell the stock and the price may jump up and down until it crosses that point. And we are interested in at what time, okay, what time this curve, this degradation curve will, cur will close this first hole. So this is what we call the first passage time. And we are interested in the first space passage time distribution. Clearly, it is a random level. So this is just the mathematical representation. But the problem we are dealing with is we collect the information about the curve, the black, black curve over here. The data may not get up to this point crossing the uh, first whole C. How we can use that data to predict or to estimate this first passage time distribution. So that is the problem we are dealing with. And of course, we are dealing with binary data. I'll explain to you what that is. Because a lot of system, they have more than one item or one component inside that. Like in LED lighting, it has a driver circuit, it has a thermal system. Either of them fail will lead to the failure of the whole LED lighting. So we have two systems, or in other words, two components inside this system. And both of them are subject to degradation. So if we can measure that, like this one, the black curve and the red, red dots, they are the two components in the system and they both subject to degradation. If either of them cross this first hole, then it is a failure. So then we have the T mean. So it's like a series system. If we have two components and one of them fail will not lead to the failure of the system, but both of them fail will lead to the failure. Then we have the T max. So this is a binary process. And we are trying to model that and try to understand what is the distribution of the T mean and T max. So that's the problem we are dealing with. Now I can go into what we are trying to achieve over here. We are trying to propose some uh, non parametric or semi parametric method, which you don't need to make a lot of assumption to do this job, to predict uh, the failure time, to estimate the failure time uh, distribution. And we perform a simulation study to evaluate different ways to do that. And and then if I have enough time, I'll present a, a real data analysis. Okay, that will be the materials we are going to cover. Uh, 
like what is the background and give you some mathematical uh, definition notation. And then I'll explain how we model the bivariate degradation process. I will start with the univariate case in one dimension, how we handle that. And then we use the copula model to model the dependency, to move it to bivariate, and then tell you the methods, the semi-parametric and non-parametric methods that we are going to use. And, and then I'll show you the simulation results and a numerical example. Okay, first of all, I talk about degradation. So how statistician or mathematician model this. We use something called Lefebvre process. It is a very general stochastic process. Uh, if you are taking a course in statistic in stochastic process, you may have seen this before. Basically, if you look at the graph, if you don't like the mathematical notation, you can skip that. You can look at the graph and understand what this is. This process is telling you how this stochastic process can describe the degradation process. We are measuring the difference between two degradation measurements. Once again, if you can't imagine that, what, what that means, think about the crack size. At different time point, we measure the crack size. We take the difference. That is my delta x, okay, delta x. And the difference between the two time point is the delta t. So that means at different time point, we do the degradation measurement and we take the difference. The V process is telling us that those differences, no matter what time point you measure, they are independent and they have a, a, a distribution there is random and the distribution will be the same. So that's the meaning of the V process. There are a lot of examples uh, for parametric Lovely process, like the gamma process. We assume the delta x is following a gamma distribution. That's the meaning. And inverse Gaussian process is assuming those differences following an inverse Gaussian distribution. Those are monotone. Monotone in the sense, like crack size, the crack will not be smaller uh, over the time. So it will just grow in one direction. But a lot, uh, there are other degradation processes. They may go up and down. Okay, they may go up and then they may go down due to many reasons, maybe the randomness uh, or the measurement error. But you may get something go up and down then you need to use a, a winner process or some other processes that is not monotone to model that. So in this talk, uh, I will focus on gamma and inverse Gaussian because the degradation process we look at, they are monotone. But those are parametric. That means we are assuming a particular distribution for those differences. By the way, we in the process assume a normal distribution for the differences. Then why beam bomb sonder distribution is playing a role here? Uh, if you have learned stochastic process, for Wiener process, the first passage time distribution is an inverse Gaussian distribution. This is a classic result in stochastic process. But then for gamma process and inverse Gaussian, there's no explicit distribution that they can find. So they use an approximation. They use spin bomb sonder distribution to approx approximate the first passage time distribution of uh, either gamma distribution, uh, gamma degradation process, or inverse Gaussian degradation process. The idea of spin bomb sonder is coming from exactly what I just mentioned about the crack size. Uh, so they are using that as an approximation, but we found that this approximation is not ideal, it's not good. Well, let me just review some parametric models for this problem, like the gamma degradation process I mentioned before. Just show you the mathematic, mathematical formula, the details, but 
the basic idea to, to take away uh, from this slide is the differences. Okay, delta x over here, delta x is following gamma distribution, following gamma distribution with the same beta over here. So this is called gamma degradation process. We are assuming a particular distribution of those differences. Same idea for inverse Gaussian. We assume the delta x is following an inverse Gaussian distribution. So if you're interested in the math, of course, you can go and look at the detail. But I just want you to, to realize this, we are making an assumption of the distribution for those differences. This is parametric approach. But we are trying to turn to non-parametric because a lot of time later on when I show you the simulation study, you will see that the results are very sensitive to the choice of the distribution. If you choose the wrong distribution to model your data, you will get some wrong results. So therefore, we try to model this by using a non-parametric approach. Without making an assumption, we can still do all this. This is called settle point approximation. We are using the idea of settle point approximation to approximate the first passage time distribution based on degradation data. I won't go into the details of the mathematics, but if you try to understand that, think about uh, an easy way to, to understand this is think about normal approximation. If we are doing normal approximation, what do you need? You need the mean and the standard duration. Then you go and apply the normal approximation. It's similar here. If I can use, well, use the mean and standard duration, you are using two moments to approximate. Set upon approximation is like you are using all the moments. The approximation is based on the moment generating function. So you are using more moments of the distribution to help you to approximate. So that's the a simple way to understand that. But that is the mathematical formula. It looks complicated, but actually it's easy to compute. Once you can get this CGF, cumulative uh, uh, empirical CGF, a uh, cumulant generating function, cumulant generating function, this is empirical, so it's based on the data. Then you can apply this approximation. And the whole thing is non-parametric. You don't need to assume the differences are following a certain distribution. And this is an example. We simulate the data from gamma and we use the uh, ESA is the non-parametric way, the empirical set upon approximation to approximate. We found that the Approximation is doing well, even you misspecify, well, compared to the case you misspecify the distribution, it's much better. So that is for the one dimension. Okay, this is for the one dimension. Now I'll move to how we model the dependency between the two degradation processes. We use the approach called cupola. Okay, we use the idea called cupola. Cupola function is linking uh, the multivariate distribution to one dimension marginal distribution. If you give me the marginal and I can put in a function called cupola function to link different marginal together to make them multivariate. Again, this is just the background, the mathematics there. A simple idea is if you give me fx and gy, two marginal distribution, the function here, c, is taking these two distribution. Whatever function c over here, this is called the coupler. C, this function is called coupler. It will give you the joint distribution. Either you can write it as joint uh, PDF, or you can write it as joint survival function. Those are the ways that we write it. Like here, we are, sorry. Oops. 
uh, yeah, this one, we are writing that as survival function. So we call it survival coupler, and we can specify that function. And there are two ways to handle this. One is we give a specific form of this C, this coupler function. You can give a specific form that we call it parametric because you specify the form. Another way is let the data to tell you what should be this function, this coupler. So for parametric way, you specify the form of the uh, coupler, the dependency. Uh, we consider uh, Archimedes couplers. It is easy to construct and it is flexible and it, it helps us to model that using one or two parameters. This is the, the definition that I want to show you some uh, examples, some members in this Archimedean couplers. Frank Coupler is one of them, it developed by Frank uh, in, in 1979. This is the form. And the only parameter here is this ZRF. There's only one parameter. This is the form of the cupola. It takes U and V over here. Another cupola we consider is the Katon cupola. Katon cupola also has one parameter, the Z subscript C. So it's taking the maximum of zero and this term. Gumbo cupola, it works well with the exponential distribution, takes also one parameter. Those are parametric. We specify the form, a mathematical formula for this cupola. And to compare them, uh, I use this graph. This has correlation, the candles tau is 0.8. So you can see that different cupola, they assign different weights to different value. For example, Frank cupola, the dependency seems even across zero to one. Remember U and V, they are the, the uh, marginal uh, CDF. So they are in between zero and one. So if you look at Kton Kupler, the dependency is stronger when it's close to zero or value close to zero. The dependency are weaker when it goes to one. Same idea. Gumbo coupler is reverse. It's stronger at the at the end, uh, close to one. So they have different properties. That raises a question: How do you choose which coupler to use? So that's the usually the parametric issue. But we can avoid that by using non-parametric okay, empirical coupler. Let the data to tell you what is the form of the coupler you should use in the modeling. This is purely based on data. If you give me the, the two sets of data, it's by very X and Z. Then I just plug in this formula to approximate this, uh, to estimate this form of cupola. We call it empirical cupola. So this is a non-parametric approach. We are not imposing a parametric form of the cupola. So now I talk about one dimension, how we model the uh, degradation data. One, if I have one degradation process, and I talk about how if we have more than one, if I have two, how to model the dependency. Now we are going to combine all this together and apply to solve our problem. Let me remind you what we are looking at about reliability of complex system. All this complex system can break into a series or parallel system. Keep it simple. Uh, if we have two degradation characteristic over here, system one and system two, if we put them in series, then we are looking at the one fail first. Either one fail will lead to the, the whole system failure. Parallel system, we are looking at the maximum of the two. That means both of them fail, then the system fail. So you have seen this graph before. Uh, that's the idea. We are looking at T mean and T max. 
we can express all this if we are using a coupler. Keep in mind, coupler is not the only approach that you can use, but we are using coupler over here. So we can write the distribution of T mean. This is the reliability function, probability T mean greater than T. We can write it in terms of the coupler. For series system, same idea for parallel system, we can write that. So now the key is how we can estimate this Rx and Rz. Those are the marginal, marginal uh, first passage time distribution of degradation process corresponding to component one. Rzt is the degradation process, uh, the first phase, first passage time distribution corresponding to the second component. Those are marginal. And then another question is how to find this coupler. I can either go and specify a form or let the data to tell me that. So if you, you see all this, there are different ways to do it. The marginal, I can uh, impose a distribution. Like if I use gamma process, I can do this whole thing. If you cross over all this, we will have some parametric, semi-parametric and non-parametric approaches. So that's what we will talk about. So this is the, the marginal, xt and zt. Now, if we cross this over, the marginal first passage time distribution and the cupola. If both of them we do parametric, that means, for example, I assume a gamma degradation process and then I use the gombo coupler. This is fully parametric. You can write down the likelihood in that case and solve that problem by estimating some parameters and solve the issue. What is the first passage time distribution for the biweary degradation process? So that's fully parametric. And similarly, instead of assuming a, a degradation process, we can always use the non-parametric way to do it, use the empirical settle point approximation. But for the dependency, we still give a parametric form. In this case, we call it semi-parametric because you do it half and half. The marginal is non-parametric, but the cupola, I specify a form. Similarly, if I do the marginal by using parametric, assume gamma process, inverse Gaussian process, and use empirical cupola. You don't specify a form for the cupola. That's another semi-parametric approach. And we also can use completely non-parametric, use empirical set point approximation for first passage time distribution, and then use empirical cupola. Then the whole process, you don't need to make any parametric assumption. There's no parametric, uh, parameters involved. And we also propose another way to do non-parametric bootstrap is using bivariate resampling, a bivariate uh, bootstrap approach to do, uh, to do this. The basic idea is you collect the data and then you calculate the differences and you put those differences into into a head, and then you randomly draw draw some of them, some of them, and build another degradation process. So that's the idea of the bootstrap method. So instead of going through the formula, I'll just skip the formula because that you can obtain them by using the result that I showed you before. But this one I want to mention because this is the bootstrap method. So we are putting the differences into, uh, into a pool and then you draw, draw those sample as the resample and calculate the uh, resampling, the approximate distribution. Okay, so let's look at some results. You will ask which way is better parametric, non-parametric. The key is whether you make the right assumption. If you make the right assumption, the data is generated from gamma, 
and you actually assume a gamma distribution, then that is good. So that's what we are trying to see. So we are doing a simulation study by generating the data from different cupola function with two sets of dependency. One is weaker, like 0.3, and other dependency is stronger, 0.8. And we generate the data from gamma process. These are the setup. We have done other setup like inverse Gaussian, uh, and we observe similar results. And we simulate this process 10,000 times, and then we go and, because it's hard to erase the difference between two distributions. So we look at the percentile uh, and calculate the mean square error. So the smaller the mean square error, the better the method. So let's look at some uh, results. First of all, we generate the data by assuming the two processes, they are independent. There's no dependency between the two processes. In other words, the two components, they work independently. And keep in mind, we are generating the data from gamma process. So the G at the beginning is stand for gamma process. IG is inverse Gaussian. We look at MLE, so that means you need to assume a certain distribution when you as, uh, analyze the data. And over here, the GBVBS is a method called Bireri Beam Bombs on the Distribution. That's an existing parametric method to approximate the first passage time distribution for Bireri uh, degradation process. So we include that in the parametric way when we do the comparison. So this MLE is parametric. Now semi one is you do non-parametric for the degradation process, but you give a particular form of a particular form of the dependency, the cupola. So that's why you see F, C, and G, Frank cupola, uh, Katon cupola, and Gumbo cupola. So that's the, what this notation is stand, is stand for. So the G and IG here is the semi two, another semi parametric approach using empirical cupola, but you need to assume a particular marginal distribution, so gamma or inverse Gaussian. So non parametric NP one is the one using empirical set point approximation, empirical cupola. NP two is the bootstrap approach. So those are the uh, notations. Now you can see, as I say, if you make the right assumption, the data is from gamma and you assume gamma, you look at this part, GF, GC, GG, they are similar because we are simulating the data under independence. So it doesn't matter what cupola, how you model the dependency. No matter what cupola you use, it will lead you to the special case that they are independent or close to independence. So that's why all these results, are, they look similar. Now, this is like the gold standard because we assume the right distribution and we use whatever cupola. So we compare our result to this set of values. Now, you look at the different ways we propose the semi parametric and parametric. You can see that the semi two, if I make the right assumption, the gamma, you actually get, get something similar to the MLE. But if you make the wrong assumption, if you make instead of gamma, you say it's, I use an inverse Gaussian, you can see the error. It can go up dramatically like instead of getting 2.81 MSE, mean square error, you have 400 something. So it is very sensitive to the choice of the marginal distribution, uh, marginal degradation process that you specify. And we want to point out that the NP1 is comparable to, to the MLE and non-parametric way, we don't even need to make any assumption. 
So if you make the wrong assumption, you get some bad results. But instead, if you don't make any assumption, we use non-parametric approach, we still maintain similar uh, error uh, estimate compared to the MLE. This is the case for independence. So let me show you a case that has weak dependency. We highlight the case that every assumption um, make correctly. You, the data is generating from Frank Kupler and the marginal degradation process, they are gamma. Uh, gamma. So GF is the right uh, model. You assume gamma, you assume Frank Kupler. So that should be the best. As you can see, they they are the best among all the all the other, except there are maybe some uh, random simulation error there. But this is the gold standard we compare to. And you look at that once again, you observe for parametric approach, if we assume the inverse Gaussian, you will get worse, much worse than the right result. And you look at the semi-parametric, it works well. You don't need to assume any distribution compared to the GF. It's not as good, of course. We don't expect it to be uh, the same, but it's comparable. And once again, we want to point out that the non-parametric one, NP1, based on empirical settle point, based on non-parametric or empirical cupola, they are comparable. And you don't need to make any assumption. So that's the selling point of what we are trying, uh, what we are doing over here. Because the good thing of non-parametric or semi-parametric is you don't need to specify a lot of things and you can achieve uh, our tasks over here. So just another example with stronger dependency, same issue. You observe that the non-parametric one actually is working well compared to the one that you need to assume everything correctly. Okay, so I have uh, about three to yeah, seven minutes. So I'll briefly go through an example to let you to see the idea. This example is modeling a bivariate LED degradation data for six samples. And we observe those degradation points at five inspection points. Those are degradation curve. The previously I show you degradation curve keep increasing, but it's the same idea. Things drop like LED lighting, the light intensity, it will keep dropping. Same thing for the battery, the capacity will keep dropping. So we are modeling that this two. Uh, LED lighting uh, component. And we assume they are, uh, we look at both parallel and series. And if that's too small to see for you, uh, the, the worst one is, or the very different one, is the Bayerere beam on the approximation, which is an existing parametric method. All the other methods, they work well compared to the parametric. People use gamma and craton to uh, gamma marginal process and craton cupola to model this kind of data, which is the black curve. Compared to that, our non-parametric and semi-parametric approach, they give similar result, okay? Except the one, the fully parametric using bivariate beam bonds on the approximation. If we use Frank Kupler, okay, we get some similar result. I switch back and forth. One is Clayton, one is Frank, and one is Gumbo. Okay, I switch back and forth, and you can see they look similar. So the choice of the Kupler may not affect the result much. That's what we observe. However, the choice of the marginal uh, distribution of the degradation process. Like if you spe if it is a gamma process, you may specify that as inverse Gaussian or other processes. You will get 
some result that may not be reasonable. So it's very sensitive to that. But the choice of cupola, we observe that it's not that sensitive. So that's the, uh, the results. And here are some references. If you're interested in uh, more, uh, actually I have some slides to do more uh, like how we do the parametric approach and some other results. Uh, okay, that's it. Thank you. Tony, thank you so much um, for presenting with us today for a fantastic presentation. Um, it's been a real pleasure to, to watch your seminar today. Um, we've got a lot of participants who've joined us, um, which is fabulous. And I'd like now to um, invite our participants to ask questions. As I mentioned at the beginning of the um, seminar, you can do this by raising your hand. Um, if you click on participants and find your name, you can raise your hand. Um, alternatively, please do use the, um, the chat if you don't have a microphone. I'm just going to turn my video off for bandwidth. Um, and I'd like to invite our first question, please. Hi, Anna. Um, Anna Gumbi, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Right, I'm not sure if you need to see my video. Uh, up to you, it's always nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. My uh, computer's been a bit finicky. Uh, good afternoon, Prof. We are enjoying the sun here. Uh, all good morning from your side. Uh, ah, there you are. Uh, since I see there are no questions, I'm quite interested in the slide you say that you have on how to present the parametric process uh, of the, you know, uh, the copulas, I'm assuming that's what you have. So um, if others don't mind, if you could please do that before we formulate more questions. Okay. Yeah, we have, uh, well, actually I don't mind to share the slides with you later on. Uh, yes, we'd be very grateful to have that. And I, I, yeah. I'm lucky enough to have received your paper as well. Yeah, I can do that. Okay, the full parametric approach. This is the way we do the, uh, how we estimate, we first estimate the parameter for the uh, marginal degradation process for the first component. Then we estimate the parameter for the second. And then we use the cupola to estimate the, the parameter in the cupola because People use different ways to do this kind of estimation. We do that by three stage. We do it one by one. Another approach is you write the whole thing as a complete form in a LILU function and maximize all these parameters. Like here, you have two parameters for gamma, uh, two parameters for gamma for the second degradation process and one parameter for the gumbo uh, or whatever cupola you use. So in total, you have five parameters, but we are doing that in, this, in the way that we do two first, another two, and then do the one for the dependency. Uh, that's why we have this, this approach. So I skip that because that will not affect what we are doing. Uh, at the end, we are doing a parametric approach, but this slide is showing you how we actually do the parametric estimation. And that's an interesting work uh, that people study. Actually, they go and study what is an efficient way to estimate the parameters. So that's what this slide is about. So I hope it helps. Uh, yeah, it does help because uh, yeah. I was curious about um, the efficiency that you you get by using your method by by um, estimating first the parameters theta and then go to estimate the um, the the gumballs if you're using gumballs uh, parameter. Yeah, it uh, it works. Uh, well, at least it make it stable, and we in our simulation we get all all the result converge. Yeah, instead of estimating that. If we have five parameters, sometimes it may not be that stable when you 
come to uh, numerical methods to do the maximization. Yeah. So that's why we choose this approach to, to do the estimation. Okay, thank you. And before yeah. somebody else jumps in, um, I'm going to also ask about uh, the times, because I see the delta t's, uh, the assumption is that uh, measurements are done in equal times. Ha have you started any work on yeah. unequal time measurements? Yeah, good question. Yeah, actually, that's, that's a point that uh, we addressed in the first paper. Let me go back to to tell you which paper you, you can look at. And we actually have another paper to, to talk about this problem. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, well, for, for the others, if you, you don't understand that this question, because the, the delta T, uh, when we take the measurement, if they are not equal for non-parametric way, for parametric way, it doesn't matter. Because like gamma, the two time point, uh, if you, you take it, the first time point is one, second time point is 11, the third time point is 12, it doesn't matter. But for non-parametric way, this will play a role. If the differences between the delta T, they are not the same for every single observation, then we need to do an adjustment. So you can look at this paper uh, over here. There's a section talk about how we handle that case. You, uh, we propose some approaches like imputation. Uh, if the two measurements, they are not the same, let's say the first one, the delta T is three, the second one, the, the delta T is six. Then what we do is we try to standardize that to all of them equal to three, but we do the imputation uh, using a random imputation to, uh, to take care of that problem. So that's one way. Another way we use a modeling approach. Uh, we impose, uh, let's say a linear relationship between the observation. Then you can easily do the interpolation to get the, the middle, uh, middle value. So that will take care of this problem. That, that is a good question. And it's actually in practice, uh, we need to think about that for the non parametric approach. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much, Prof. Yeah. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, right, would the next person like to, as Anna put it, I like the way Anna put it, would the next person like to jump in with a question or comment? Uh, thank you for the lecture. I just wanted to know how um, you define those uh, th thresholds. Um, I don't know how the different systems work, but uh, I suspect that each and every system will have, uh, you know, uh, will have a way of defining the, 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 the threshold. So I'm just curious uh, exactly how yep. you choose it. And another question is in relation to the uh, methods that you're using or the parametric methods that you're using. So how about um, you treat it like, uh, uh, once you move into uh, the degression state, it is permanent, so you can use maybe the traditional models that we know about lifetime modeling. Uh, I don't know whether I'm making sense, but uh, <laughs> uh, I can repeat the question in case. Uh, yeah, uh, let me see if I can address that. For the first question, uh, how we determine this C? You are exactly right. It depends on the item that you are looking at. Uh, for example, I, I can give you an example in battery because I work with uh, battery degradation data also. Uh, for battery, if the battery capacity drop below uh, 70%, then they claim that is a failure. Okay. In other words, if uh, like the battery people use in, in electric car, like Tesla, uh, they won't wait till the battery die. When the battery drop below 70%, uh, in terms of the capacity, then they will claim that is a failure and they will replace that battery. And that actually happen if you're using uh, iPhone or any phone, they have a way to check your battery capacity. 
and if you have your iPhone, you can go to battery and look at that. And that's a number. And if you take take that to the Apple store and ask them to replace the battery, they will look at that number. If that number, sometimes I think they use 80%. If it drop below 80%, then they will recommend you to replace that, even though your battery is still working. So that C it's depending on the the context and the user and also uh, the manufacturer. So that that is for your first question. So I hope I answered the first question. Uh, for your second question, the, the thing is, you are, uh, if I understand your question correctly, if we actually observe, I'm showing this graph because if you actually observe the curve passing C, if all the degradation curve, you observe that, you are exactly right. You can use that value because I observed TC in this case. I can get the TC and use the usual way to model lifetime. I actually observed the lifetime. But a lot of cases for degradation data is you only observe the, the data up to like this point. I don't know whether you can see the point as well up to this point, and you don't get to see the rest. In other words, the degradation process have not crossed the first hole. So in that case, we need the techniques that we propose over here to handle that. So I, does it make sense or do I yes, answer yeah, your question? Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful. Um, thank you, Justine, for your questions.